Okay, we're going to begin. So first of all, um, I'd like to welcome everyone who's joined us at this meeting. This is a meeting that's being hosted by the Revolutionary Communist International. My name is Fiona. I am a member of the Revolutionary Communist Party in Britain, which is the British section of the international that I have just mentioned. Now, this meeting is titled Where Next for Bangladesh? And we are all here because we have just witnessed a historic, uh, monumental moment in Bangladesh. Bangladesh, where the masses have, have come together um, and forced Hasina, the prime minister, to flee the country. Um, but this isn't the end of the story. We're here to discuss where next. I'm going to introduce the meeting and then we're going to hear from a range of different speakers, a range of different comrades, leading comrades, one of whom is Ben Curry, a leading comrade of the Revolutionary Communist International and a regular writer for Marxist.com. A lot of the recent articles on Marxist.com um, have been written by him, for example. We're also going to hear from Adam Powell, a leading comrade, um, a leading revolutionary from Pakistan, from the Inkalabi Communist Party in Pakistan. Pakistan. And we're also really excited and thrilled to hear from student activists in Bangladesh um, who've been involved in the struggle. Um, Abdullah Hel Baboon will be speaking. Um, and then if anyone has any questions at any point in the meeting, you can write them in the chat and they will be sent. Um, and then if we can reply and sum up to those questions at the end, we will do so. Um, and this is also just an appeal. If you listen to what we talk about here and what is discussed and you agree with the ideas, we're putting this on also because we want to meet people who want to join the struggle and join the Revolutionary Communist International. And there is a form um, that you can fill out if you're interested in doing so and someone will be in touch. So why are we here and what has brought this movement um, to a head? Well, the Supreme Court in, um, in Bangladesh decided to reinstate a quota system. And this system, um, this quota system, was one that reserved one third of all public sector government jobs to descendants of freedom fighters. Now, we have to say this was a punitive system um, and this punitive system was used by the Awami League. It was used by Hasina's party to essentially control whoever could receive government jobs. Um, and if, in fact, who even is defined as a descendant of a freedom fighter? And we have to put this quota system in the context of a country which is also suffering from huge inflation and growing unemployment. In fact, there was a statistic um, that is really useful, which just shows the scale of how big this problem is um, from 2023 from the Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics, which found that 39 percent of 15 to 24 year olds don't have jobs and are not studying either. So that translates to about 12.2 million people, um, which is a huge huge amount. And so to implement this kind of quota system in such a context was to cut off so many people um, at a chance in life. And this is really a big feeling, I think, that came about in the movement. The students began protesting and it started off with the quota system, but it morphed into something much more, which we'll go on to cover. So the students were protesting from the start that this quota system should be abolished. And I think it's first of all um, interesting for us to note that this isn't the first time people have protested against this quota system specifically. In fact, as I said, this was a reintroduction because there were mass protests in 2018 that were so powerful, actually, that Hasina was forced and, and the state was forced to temporarily scrap the system because they could see how determined the student protesters were. Nevertheless, time has passed and they felt confident enough to try and re-implement it. But this confidence was very misplaced, um, as we soon saw. Now, we should say that we know that students in Bangladesh have always been not only a barometer for the mood in society, but have even played massive leading roles in revolutionary events. And that was true in 1971 all the way up until today. And that is what we have all just been witness to. These protests began on university campuses um, around the start of July, peaceful protests, people coming together, assembling to protest against it. However, the response to these protests from the state was completely disproportionate. The most brutal form of violence was immediately employed using first and foremost, we should say, the student wing of the Awami League, the Chatra League, the BCL, these BCL students violently attacked the other students who were protesting in a totally discriminate manner. 
And around this time, as the first weeks of July started to take place, I know I myself, I began to receive messages from students in Bangladesh, in Dhaka in particular, because they wanted people, they wanted to draw attention to what was happening. Um, because this was when the situation was becoming critical, was becoming serious and dangerous. The violence was at such a scale and it seemed to be happening without any repercussions, right? There was this sense, this feeling that these people are getting away with murder and no one is doing anything about it. I remember the women's halls, the residence halls in Dhaka University, they were attacked. And when the police arrived, the police were using open fire against the students themselves. Now, why did this happen? Hasina thought perhaps that a quick, swift, brutal response would crush the movement at the beginning, would crush the movement at the start. But in fact, the exact opposite took place. And actually this murder, this violence instead reignited a fire and anger at the Hasina regime. On top of this, there was a lot of things that she did in particular that exacerbated the movement and even in fact spurred it on, we would say. On the 14th of July, she held a news conference and half an hour into this news conference, conference sorry, she described the demonstrators as Rajakars. Now, this word is used to describe people who collaborated with Pakistan during the 1971 war, which she was then contrasting with the descendants of the freedom fighters for whom they wanted to you know, use this quota system to guarantee them jobs. This was an absolutely outrageous um, word to use. And again, it sparked the movement even further. The Rajakars were the shock troops that Pakistan used against the liberation movement, for example. Um, they helped the Pakistan army to massacre local populations and even rape women. So to use this term was deliberately incendiary um, and sparked the movement on even further. Using this showed the complete arrogance and contempt that Hasina had. Uh, and this arrogance, as I said, is something that would eventually lead to her downfall. The, what you saw in the midst of those protests was people using that word in the chants, and that was taking place in Dhaka, but also in London, all over the world where people were protesting. If you were going to call us this word, we're going to turn it against you because we know the truth of what genuine liberation is and who is actually fighting for a free, genuinely equal Bangladesh. And it's not Hasina. That was the mood in all of these protests. I would then say the middle of July saw another big turning point um, on the 16th of July in particular, where at one university um, or outside in the streets, you had the police firing tear gas at the students. They were trying any time the students would gather on a mass scale, they would constantly try and get them to disperse. And there was one student, a coordinator of the movement, a well-known student activist, Abu Saeed. And whilst many of the students were fleeing to try and get away from the tear gas, he decided not to run, but to turn and boldly face the police head on. And in response to this, they shot him. They shot him square in the chest, I think four times. And this cold, brutal act of murder um, is actually something that has happened many times throughout Hasina's regime against any discontent, against any protest, against workers, even when they have been on strike. And even in the, the anti-quota movement itself, this kind of cold hearted killing happened again and again and again. But this one act of this killing of this man became a symbol. And this is something that happens a lot in revolutionary moments, even something that is almost unfortunately, unfortunately an ordinary aspect of life can suddenly become a turning point. And I believe the killing of Abu Sayyid acted in this way. That murder and, and his bravery became the symbol of defiance and determination that was forming itself on the side of the students, in contrast with the complete cold, lethal cowardice of the government, of the police, of the BCL, and all of the agents of the state and Hasina's regime. And we would say this is a very critical moment because once the masses begin to lose their fear, it puts the ruling class and the regime in a very dangerous situation because there's nothing that they can then use against them. When the struggle begins to reach a boiling point, all of the weapons of the state, as big as they are, as formidable as they are, they cannot suppress the collective power of the masses themselves. Now, it was, of course, unfortunately, not just violence that the state attempted to use, but confusion and demoralization. 
They did this through shutting off the internet and mobile connection for large quantities of time. We were attending protests in London, and I remember talking with comrades, talking with people at the protests, and they were sharing with us their fear and anxiety at not having any contact with friends and family back at home, wondering every single day whether they were safe, whether they were alive. And I think it was around this time, around this internet blackout in particular, that we also sought to do more to try and uplift the struggle of the Bangladeshi students. Because we should say the international media was completely silent on what was taking place and therefore completely complicit as well. During these blackouts, the state was amping up its repression because they thought they could get away with it. So we would go hours without any information of what was going on. And then suddenly you would see uh, an influx of videos and pictures of the torture and murder that was taking place. And they even arrested the student leaders and attempted to force them to call up the protests through a video. But I would say that the spirit of this burgeoning revolutionary movement was too great and was too high. And so people could see through all of these tactics. To quote a message that was actually left by hackers on the prime minister's official website, they said, this is not a protest anymore, it's a war. And that just shows how the tide was beginning to change. Even though the international media was silent and you didn't um, hear about this in the mainstream news, I think the whole of the Bangladeshi diaspora was watching this and speaking about it everywhere they go. Here in East London in particular, we were attending rallies and, and I was speaking at rallies and there were thousands of people who were at these protests. At one day, we even went to Trafalgar Square. We went right outside the Houses of Parliament to uplift the struggle and we called out Tulip Sadiq. Now, Tulip Sadiq is a Labour MP. In fact, she's a minister who is the niece of Hasina and she hasn't said one word about the whole quota movement or the fall of Hasina or anything. Now, she pretends, and or she would like to pretend, that she is somehow distant from the Awami League and is not involved in any way. But we know that that's completely untrue. We know that she is entirely connected with the Awami League and, in fact, uses the Awami League to help her political work in Britain. Um, and so that will be an ongoing campaign that we will, we will continue to wage. But we also attended a vigil um, to mark the, the numbers, the sheer numbers, the hundreds and hundreds of students who have been killed in this protest, where we organised to try and bring other students from universities across London um, to come along. It was called, you know, Student for Student. And this is because we wanted to show the students in Bangladesh that their true and main allies are the students and the workers of other countries. And that is who we have to have faith in. Often in times like this, there's this pressure to call on the international community as a whole to intervene. But we have to be clear about what we mean by community. And we base that on, on class. The international community in the abstract is the same system, the same system that facilitates the exploitation of the Bangladeshi workers that wouldn't lift a finger to do anything in Bangladesh unless it was going to damage their profits in some in some capacity. That is the only um, you know, banner upon which the international community gets involved. So the true allies are the students and workers of other countries. And that is what we, we were striving to, to highlight. So this combination of violence and internet blackout meant there was no way back for the student protesters. A common chant in the street was, you know, first count the bodies, then the quota. It was no longer about the quota system. In fact, they even were forced to repeal the quota system. But this didn't mean that the movement ended and everyone went back home. The students concentrated on one main demand that Hasina must go. And we called, uh, we joined this call on protests in London and comrades in New York and, and all over the world joined in on this. The point is... Through the violence of the state, the legitimacy and the authority of the Awami League was completely destroyed. And instead, it was the student leaders who had gained real authority. So when they put out the call for the long march to Dhaka on the 5th of August, millions followed and millions showed up on that day, including workers. The night before was one of anticipation. I remember, you know, even all the way from London going to bed thinking, what will tomorrow look like? What will it bring? This movement began with a small layer in society, but it won over millions in the process. And in fact, there was even a call for a general strike from these student leaders, which was observed by workers in different districts. When you see the videos and the pictures of what came out of those last couple of days, it shows the real balance of forces in society. And when you see it, I think you can't help but feel euphoric and inspired 
this is where the real power in society lies. It was those masses as a whole that struck fear right into the heart of Hasina. And so eventually the army, they panicked, they, they could see what was coming. And so they had to tell her, you have to go. They had to force her out. And so she fled to India. And as she fled, we celebrated in East London, as did many all around the world. The mood was amazing. The scenes of ordinary people, you know, taking over her residence, going in with all her luxury belongings spread across social media. It was very reminiscent, reminiscent I would say, of when the masses did the same in Sri Lanka. And isn't that such a small example of what we are ultimately fighting for as revolutionaries, as revolutionary communists? We want to live in a world where the masses and the workers have access to what we actually create, um, what the workers actually build, rather than the parasites who live off us. I think those pictures and those videos are such a small example of, of that. But the point is, where are we at now? This is not the end of the story. And now we're in a certain limbo. An interim government has been formed with the student coordinators. They were part of negotiating the setup of this government. And the government has appointed Dr. Yunus as a caretaker leader. But people are referring to this as a new Bangladesh, Bangladesh 2.0. And why? It's not just because of the removal of Hasina. It's because of what is actually happening in the streets today. We've seen pictures, videos of students mainly out in the streets, cleaning it up, repainting walls, facilitating the flow of traffic. I've seen videos of people in the street allowing the cars to pass freely. Also calling for the protection of religious minorities. All of this in a miniature form, in an embryo, what we're seeing is how the masses and students and workers can actually self-organize. And I would say not even just organize, but in fact, run society themselves without bosses, without landlords, without capitalists. One of the committees that was set up was to monitor the price of goods to avoid speculation. So the point now is this. These student leaders have led this revolution on the grounds of democracy. But we have to ask, what is democracy, real democracy? Well, we have just seen it. You see, a revolution is when the masses are intervening in their own story, in their own history, and actively, consciously are taking control over it. So for this democracy to become real and to become more than just a flashpoint, what we are saying is this revolution must continue. It must continue. Our message from the start stays the same as it is now, which is that we call on the students and the workers in Bangladesh to trust in themselves and themselves alone. The revolution would not have been possible without first and foremost the leadership of the student movement. There's no doubt about it. The fact that they set up a national coordinating committee was absolutely the right thing to do. But now this leadership that has a lot of authority, we would say has to choose a path, the path of conciliationism with an interim government, which represents the interests of bankers, of lawyers, of top army chiefs, or the path of revolution. Now, this interim government, there's no doubt they want a stable Bangladesh. But stable for whom? That is what we're here to ask. They want a stable Bangladesh that is stable for their interests, the interests of capitalism. And we're here to say that our message as revolutionary communists is that we also want a stable Bangladesh that is run in the interests of the students and workers. And the only people that we trust to actually do that is students and workers themselves. And that sh those students and workers, if they want to spread this movement, if they want to win more people over, they need a program they need a program that answers the needs of students and workers across the whole of Bangladesh. And that will only come from themselves. It won't come from the BNP or the other right wing, the other corrupt parties that exist in Bangladesh. Only a revolutionary party, a genuinely revolutionary party that is based first and foremost on the working class and the needs of the students, only that sort of party could develop a program that could actually transform Bangladesh by fighting for democracy, yes, by fighting against capitalism, which produces anti-democratic politicians, which produces dictatorship, which produces violence and misery and poverty. So that is what we're fighting for, the construction of such a party in Bangladesh and all over the world. So that is my introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and now... I'm really pleased to introduce Ben Curry, who's a leading comrade from the Revolution Commons International, who will develop on this further. So thank you, Ben. Thank you, Fiona. Um, yes, uh, I, th I thought that was a, a great introduction. Um, sorry, if you bear with me one moment. Just uh, some Zoom things. Um, yeah, so I think Fiona um, developed uh, excellently on, on how this movement has 
begun and and how it has developed. It started out as a as a heroic revolt of the students, um, but what it's turned into is is an immense popular revolution, drawing upon all of the uh, oppressed layers in, in in society in Bangladesh, and um, it has scored a historic victory. Um, people are talking about this as the second Independence Day, uh, you know, the fifth of August when Hasina fell. Um, and we're we're here first and foremost to to uh, celebrate those victories, um, which have been won at an enormous cost. Let's not forget that, of course, hundreds of people have laid down their lives. People, the, the official figures are now saying over six hundred people. Um, but the the purpose of this meeting is is more than simply to celebrate. Of course, we we wish to do that, but we want to also analyze. We want to um, first of all analyze how were those victories won, um, and what were the lessons of the revolution so far? Rev uh, revolutionary lessons that can be taken and applied internationally, which are general, in fact. And uh, perhaps most important of all, we want to look at this uh, the, the, the question from a revolutionary communist perspective. Where do we see things going next? Um, because the way we see it, as I think will become clear, is this revolution is an unfinished revolution. In fact, not only is it an unfinished revolution, really, this is only a, a revolution that is only just beginning. This is the first chapter of the revolutionary, uh, uh, the, 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 the revolution in Bangladesh. But let's start, first of all, with this question. How was, were these tremendous uh, democratic victories won? Well, let's be clear. The first thing is that uh, everything that has been won, from the repeal of the 30% quota, um, uh, to the resignation of Hasina herself, and, and things that have been won since then, the driving of the, the killer police off the streets, um, uh, the, uh, the resignation of the, the, the head of the central bank and the chief justice, which has happened because of the continued mobilization since Hasina fell, um, the prosecutions which are now taking place against um, Awami League officials, all of this was won on the streets, and it was won by the students at the expense of, and, and paid for in, in blood. Th these are the people that won this. Now, Dr. Yunus and his ministers, this new interim government, they did not play any role in this. This is the first thing to say. Uh, they, they, they cannot claim any responsibility for a single one of these, these demogra democratic gains. Um, these gains have been taken and won by the people themselves. And uh, the reason that the, the ruling class were forced to, to, to make these, uh, these concessions is because they were afraid precisely that this elemental movement that erupted uh, would sweep away their whole system, a system which is still in place, by the way. It's the old state is still in place, the old judiciary, the old uh, police, the generals, and so forth. To save themselves, they sacrificed their figurehead, Hasina, um, and they were forced to come to negotiations with the students. Um, but the second lesson, I think, of the, of the revolution, besides the fact that it's the revolutionary masses that won everything in, in, the, in the last analysis, is that uh, the revolution reached a decisive turning point on Monday, the 5th of August. Now, why was that a decisive uh, uh, turning point? I think fundamentally the reason for that is because the students correctly, who have been at the vanguard of this movement, uh, who have been in the leadership of this movement, they correctly put the call out uh, for, for the broad exploited masses to join them in a general strike and a march on Dhaka. And it was, it was precisely because the masses responded in their millions Beyond the students, of course, lawyers, doctors and teachers, but above all, millions of, of workers, of informal sector workers, rickshaw drivers, uh, peasants, they took to the streets on the 5th of August in enormous numbers. And it was, it was precisely the, 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 the strength of those numbers that paralyzed the state and, and began the process of the complete decom decomposition of Hasina's regime. It was the broad exploited masses led by the students who won this democratic victory. That's the, the main thing that I want to, to underline. But now the question is posed, and, and this question is, uh, this point is arrived at in every revolution. Uh, who is going to take the power next? Um, who is going to fill the vacuum that now exists? Well, if we have to be honest, in the past week, uh, two powers have begun emerging side by side with each other. Um, and uh, to, to state the truth, these two powers are completely irreconcilably opposed in their interests, despite the fact that now you notice that there are police chiefs and ex Awami League officials, they're all praising the students for keeping order on the street. They all want to be seen as Democrats now. They're all trying to desperately reinvent themselves, right? But the old capitalist state still exists. The old police chiefs, the old judges, the, the old generals, they still exist. They're still there. The state hasn't been smashed. And unless it is smashed, um, uh, they, will, they will wait and bide their time. They're too terrified of the masses on the streets now to, to carry out an immediate counter-revolutionary coup, but they're biding their time and they want to deliver a blow against the revolution. But the, and this is the reason they are paralyzed is because there is a second power in society which has emerged in the course of this revolution. And that is the elemental power of the students and of the masses on the streets themselves. 
Um, when the police, uh, the police went on strike last, uh, the, uh, when immediately after Hasina fell, because they were afraid of reprisals, right? Uh, these hated killers uh, uh, fled the streets. Who was it that kept order on the streets after they fled? Who was it who filled their role uh, on the streets? Who kept the traffic moving? Uh, who, who was it who went down to Hindu temples and tried to protect against any attempt at whipping up chaos and counter-revolutionary violence? It was the students. And in many cases, these students spontaneously had organized or had been organized by student coordinators into committees and groups of action uh, all over the country. Um, and uh, in some places, they went actually beyond the students to inc include broader layers, workers and general members of the public. Um, and uh, they showed in, they started in some places to take on the basic functions of the state. They began to displace those functions. And what immense creativity. We should point to this example. We should elevate this example. Although it's only an embryo, these committees weren't extended everywhere. It was an embryo, but it's a, it's a marvelous example that, as, as Fiona shows, it shows the masses can run society without the help of the bureaucratic capitalist state. And in fact, without capitalists and landlords uh, and exploiters whatsoever. And we would say that in order to, uh, to consolidate the revolution, it's necessary to extend this example to encourage actually not only students, but factory workers, informal sector workers, peasants to form their own committees, to form their own organization, and to begin the process of purging the old state and taking power completely into their own hands. That old state, of course, being completely dominated by the Awami League officials at every level. Now, unfortunately, this is our perspective. This is what we put forward as the way to complete the revolution. But unfortunately, the student coordinators who have immense authority, of course, because of their leadership of this, this incredible movement, they didn't share that perspective. They didn't have that perspective. Instead, of course, they entered into negotiations with the army. And uh, uh, after uh, the, uh, the outcome of those negotiations was that the student coordinators agreed to the formation of a new interim government and lent their authority to a government which does not deserve that authority whatsoever. That is the government led by Dr. Mohammed Yunus. And we have to say, uh, bluntly and openly, we think that is a mistake. We think that is a grave error. Now, this character, Dr. Yunus, he has a certain amount of credibility at the moment because he too was persecuted by Hasina, really as a rival faction of the capitalist class. But we have to state things uh, as, as part of a rival faction, but we have, to, we have to state what is. He is a banker and he is a stooge of US imperialism. That is the fact of the matter. He's an enemy of the working class and of the revolutionary students. And if we look at his cabinet right now, it is full of bankers, of CEOs, of uh, directors, of ex-army officers, uh, former ambassadors. In other words, they're all drawn from the ruling class. They're not drawn from the exploited masses. And only two, I mean, there may be a third one now, I think, but there's, there's only two or three students that are actually serving as ministers. And the purpose of those students is actually to be captive to this, what is a capitalist cabinet full of capitalist ministers and to give an, a certain amount of legitimacy to a government which does not deserve that legitimacy, which played no role in the success of the revolution. The role of this government is to demobilize the masses while preserving the old capitalist state in, 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 uh, to, to completely preserve that, that state as, as far as possible and actually to attempt to renew its legitimacy. We should say, no, that legitimacy must end now. It's proven, the old capitalist state has proven what, it's, what it exists for, to keep the masses under the iron heel of the, the dictatorship of capital. They want to restore an environment precisely in which the multinationals and the factory owners can start going back to work Bangladesh is open for business again. They can continue to uh, extract enormous profits off the sweat and blood of the, 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 the hyper-exploited working class of Bangladesh. Now, uh, we can already see, actually, it's only like a week and a half old, this government, and yet they've already started to, to go down this road. They're showing exactly what they're really uh, about. First of all, who did Dr. Yunus accept his nomination from? Did he accept that he was nominated by the revolutionary masses on the street? No, it was the, it was the presidency. They need to, re they, they want to create this, institutional continuity, preserve the old state. Um, and already his government after this strike by these hated killer police has encouraged the police with army protection to return back to the police stations and to get back on the streets. In other words, they're trying to restore the legitimacy of this rightly hated organ of the state. And they've made it a top priority to collect all the weapons that were taken from the police during the uprising by the revolutionary masses and return them to police stations. In other words, they want to restore the monopoly of violence that that old state has, um, which it exercises in the interests of the ruling class. And we should also know that he's already entered into negotiations with the, the bosses of the factory, uh, the, the, the garment factories 
talking to them about the possibility of giving them tax breaks, helping them to restore profit and conf business confidence they talk about, basically. But an environment of exploitation is what they want to, to restore. And this is just one week into this government. So we, we declare that we have absolutely no confidence in this government of Dr. Yunus. And unless the students organize their own revolutionary party and begin agitating for a completion of the revolution, for the, 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 the mass of the, pop, of the population, the workers, the exploited, and the students to seize the power from the old capitalist state and smash that state, then Dr. Yunus has, uh, uh, the, there is the possibility that he may succeed for a time in demobilizing people. People, of course, are tired. They can't stay mobilized indefinitely. Unless there is a decisive break, people will have to go home eventually and consider what the next steps are. But there will be next steps. This, this opens, what, what, what is opening now is, is a new chapter in the revolution. Um, uh, either, basically, in this new chapter, either the revolution will move forward or it will move backwards. That's what we would say. Um, now, what can it move forward to? Well, first of all, we would say that it is completely ruled out that Dr. Yunus or any other capitalist government will be able to consolidate a regime of liberal de democracy on a capitalist basis. Now, why do we say that? The problem is the, is the economic system that exists in Bangladesh. It is a system which is based upon the super exploitation of the working class by foreign multinationals, by corrupt factory owners, by landlords and so forth, all of whom, by the way, are linked to the old Awami League state. That's the nature of, of Bangladeshi capitalism. How do these people get rich? By their connections, by their friendships with the, the, the politicians in the, of the ruling party and so forth. They're all connected in a, in a big web of exploitation and oppression. And um, this, the, the, the brutal regime that existed in, in Bangladesh exists to ensure the massive wealth of these, these parasites continues to, to, to flow into their pockets. And that, that brutality exists to keep the, the, the working class, to keep the peasantry, and to keep the, all of the masses down, basically. But uh, millions of people now feel they've won a democratic victory. That old state still exists, but they feel that they've won that democratic victory. They've won a democratic regime in Bangladesh. But for the mass of ordinary people, for the millions on the streets, for the working class, democracy is not an abstract thing. Democracy is not some wonderful thing where you just say what you want and then you go home. Democracy is a tool. Democracy is a means to protest, to struggle, and to, to, to fight for a dignified existence, basically. And that's how people see it. They've won this, this democracy. Now let's use it. Let's use it to get decent pay. Let's use it to get permanent contracts. Let's use it to get shorter working hours and, and the repayment of our wages, which haven't been paid on time. And um, yes, uh, uh, th this is, these factors, these economic factors were also a big part of the anger which, which flowed into that revolutionary movement which reached its peak on the 5th of August. Yes, people, people feel suffocated by the undemocratic regime of, 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 of Hasina, but there's also been an accumulation of anger against rising prices, a rising cost of living, and brutal oppression by minor state officials and factory owners. You know, Hasina has gone, but in every, every factory owner is like a little Hasina that is, that is lording it over the workers and the, uh, the exploited. And in the past week, we've seen, actually, we predicted that this victory would open up a period of class struggle. It's lifted the lid on all of the contradictions in Bangladeshi society. And despite Dr. Yunus talks about now we need reconciliation, it's extended the olive branch to, uh, to, to uh, the former Awami League politicians. Um, there's the work for the workers and for the oppressed masses. There's going to be no question of reconciling them with their with their most hated enemy, their exploiters and oppressors. And we've seen an explosion of action on the streets by the workers. Uh, uh, we've seen uh, strikes. We've seen uh, protests, highway blockades, factory occupations, even uh, putting forward nine point demands, 13 point demands directly. In other words, emulating the, 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 the one point demands and the, 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 thir the 13 point demands and so forth that the students were putting forward. Um, so we've seen this actually um, from the reports, uh, from what I've heard from, from, from comrades who follow the press in Bangladesh. This hasn't been reported in the mainstream media, but it is starting to bubble away. The workers are taking action over unpaid wages, trade union rights against brutal killings of workers by those little Hasinas in the factories that I talked about. And as this struggle advances, this idea that we're putting forward, generalize this, this example of, 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 uh, of, of, of committees, of uh, the people taking control through their own organs of struggle, and therefore form workers' committees to take up this fight and link them with student committees, um, this will gain an echo because the, the, the experience in, in the forthcoming period is going to radicalize the revolution even further. And people are going to see that the old capitalist state 
cannot satisfy their most basic demands, even though it's no longer Hasina in the helm, it's Dr. Yunus or some other capitalist politician. So um, ultimately, yes, the, 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 in this new chapter, the, the role of the working class is going to come to the fore. That's what we believe. And the workers are the decisive factor in society. They produce all of its wealth. They are the ones that run society, and they are concentrated in large numbers in the centers of political and economic power. They are the only consistently revolutionary class in society, and the most revolutionary layer of students can play a vital role in, in propelling this struggle of the working class forward and of opening up the perspective of the workers seizing power and putting an end to the rotten capitalist system that exists in Bangladesh. The, the, the most revolutionary layers of students need to develop a program that connects precisely with the workers' demands, that takes up the workers' demands, and connects the workers' demands with the need to organize committees and organize the struggle at the grassroots level, linking them up locally and nationally with workers' and students' committees elsewhere, and ultimately fighting to seize power from the old capitalist state. Because as this explosion of class struggle erupts, it's going to quickly expose Dr. Yunus and his cabinet. Um, when, the, when the bosses and the workers begin to clash, as they are beginning to do, which side is he going to take? He's going to take the side of the bosses. So they will end up betraying the democratic promises that they've made. It's worth asking the question, actually, why has Hasina's regime been so dictatorial? It's not because of some bad character trait of Hasina. It's because the class contradictions in Bangladesh are too great. Um, they can't make concessions to the workers. They have to keep them crushed beneath an iron heel of a dictatorship. We can contrast this with the, with the West. Why do we have democratic regimes in the West? Why are they, we able to have these here, but not in somewhere like Bangladesh? It's because the capitalist class in the West makes super profits from exploiting the working class of the whole globe. And with those super profits, they can buy a certain amount of social peace. They can buy off a layer of, uh, of, of, of more privileged workers, particularly the trade union leaders and so forth. Um, but that in, in Bangladesh, that's ruled out because it is a, it is an, it, their capitalism is based upon super exploitation. It's uh, the, the only thing that the ruling class has to maintain their system is brutal counter-revolutionary repression. And we'll see that any capitalist government is going to be forced to go down that road. And so the task is posed. Either the revolution will move backwards if the present government succeeds in frustrating and tiring the masses, um, and then the army will try to reassert itself. Or the revolution must move forward, which is only possible if the working class seizes power into its own hands, organizing an alternative power through committees and other such organs of, of worker and student control. And if the working class seizes power, only then can you cut the, the, the power of this rotten clique of, of, of capitalists at its root, which is in their economic power, only by expropriating the wealth of Hasina and her clique and all of these factory owners that are linked to the Awami League and so forth, as well as the multinationals, which have done very good deals with Hasina over years. Only then can you break with the, 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 fundamentally, the fundamental root of this undemocratic system, which is, which is capitalism, and create a regime of genuine democracy, which is one of workers' democracy, in which the workers, the students, the peasants, and the exploited masses as a whole control the economy and society. You could, you could say that in, in Bangladesh, you could draw a bit of an analogy with past revolutions. In the Russian revolution of 1917, the, 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 the masses came onto the street and they swept the Tsar aside. The, Tsar, the old Tsarist empire collapsed. But the old state still exist, only, uh, existed, only with a democratic face. Uh, it was called the provisional government. That happened in the February revolution of 1917. It became necessary to build for a revolutionary party to, org to agitate for a new revolution in which the workers seized power directly, smashing the whole state, not just getting rid of the Tsar. And that came in October 1917, and the working class seized power under the leadership of the Bolshevik party. But the presence of a party, the Bolshevik party, to lead that was vital for the success of the, uh, of the October revolution in Russia. Bangladesh has had its February. It's had its, uh, its, its, its great spontaneous mass movement in which the, the old dictator has fallen. Now it needs to fight for its, its October revolution. And in order to do that, what is needed is a Bolshevik style organization, a revolutionary communist party in Bangladesh to agitate precisely for that. So finally, what we say is in order to achieve this, 
First and foremost, our, our main demand is no trust in Dr. Yunus's government. Second of all, take the example of the committees and spread them, especially to the workers. And thirdly, call a national congress of representatives of worker and student committees and link those up. And then the students and workers must seize power into their own hands, expropriating the capitalists. The revolution in Bangladesh isn't finished. And how it unfolds now is uh, uh, it will depend on the balance of forces. It's a struggle of living forces. And everyone here has a role to play in that. To push this program forward, what is needed is a Bolshevik type party, a revolutionary communist party. And as members of the Revolutionary Communist International, we're fighting to form such a party in every country in the world, including in Bangladesh. So if you agree with these ideas, whether you're in Bangladesh, whether you're in the US, whether you're in Britain or Pakistan or anywhere, join the Revolutionary Communist International. That's the, what, that's the main appeal we want to, to make in this meeting in order to, that, the, that the Bangladeshi October will be achieved and it can become the spark for the World Socialist Revolution. Thank you, Ben, um, for that amazing development um, on perspectives and what we see taking place. Um, okay, next, um, I'm really pleased to introduce Abdullah Hel Babun, an important student activist um, in Bangladesh. So I'll ask to unmute you now. Uh, hello, I am Babun. I am currently studying in Dhaka University. Right now, there is uh, there is an smear campaign campaign going on against the leftists in universities and everywhere else as well. Like uh, it's true that left has been complicit with the army regime. And um, in two thousand fourteen, when um, um, like uh, Hasina has uh, led a mock election, the left has joined the election and um, and uh, left for a long time uh, thought that. Uh, Communalism is a major challenge that needs needs to be solved in Bangladesh first. Then there will be socialist revolution or something like that. So this is why this is why like um, the right wing forces and anti leftist forces are now blaming the leftists leftist for being complicit with the fascist Hazina regime. However, in this movement, uh, left has played a major role. Like after after the curfew was lifted, the movement has uh, has slowed down a bit. But in third August, uh, there was something called a Droho Jatra, meaning like a um, mass rebellious procession, and the leftist has led that led that procession. And uh, in that procession, in that uh, in this in this process, this procession was presided by Anu Muhammad and. An independent leftist and intellectual in Bangladesh, and after that third August march, uh, the movement has picked new forces, and that culminated in the fleeing of Hasina on fifth August. So the situation in Bangladesh is uh, right wing forces are now getting ground, and uh, they are saying that they have fought against the Hasina regime. They have been. Uh, they have suffered most at the hands of Hasina, like Jamaat Islam, Hifazot Islam. Uh, what I think the left should do now is they should uh, they should organize themselves and they should uh, do their politics. They should not uh, be led into the cultural war, like cultural war, secular secularism versus religion. They should not uh, uh, they should not mobilize their most attention to these cultural wars. Um, instead of this, they should organize the workers. The CST, the Chittagong Hill Trucks, is one of the most oppressed areas of Bang oppressed area in Bangladesh, and uh, and uh, their lands are being dispossessed by Bengali settlers. They are they are constantly being tortured, raped, and murdered by Bangladeshi army. And left should uh, work with these people, work with these oppressed people. And I think, uh, um, apart from organizing the apart from organizing the workers workers of industrial sectors, the left should also uh, give their attention to the informal sectors of economy because there is a vast informal sectors of economy that uh, that has been created after the new liberalization of Bangladesh in nineteen nineties. Um, as you as you all know, uh, after the eighties and nineties, uh, Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh has become a bastion of global new liberalism and uh, and uh, 
uh, after the land dispossession that happened in 1980s in Bangladesh, many many people came to came to the cities and they and uh, because of the small scale of our industrial sector, they joined this informal economy. So I I think that as well as organizing the uh, working class of garment sectors and uh, uh, other people oppressed other people minority people oppressed in bangladesh uh, we should uh, we should focus our attention to uh, the informal sectors as well the hawkers the um, the tea sellers um, and uh, the issue about communism that is being uh, that is being published in Indian media as well as other media that uh, Bangladeshi Hindus are at risk. And it is true that uh, uh, there has been vandalization on Hindu temples, Hindu houses, and Hindus are being targeted as the... Um, Hindus as, as are being targeted as as the complicit uh, with Aum League. And the people are saying, the right-wing forces are saying that Hindus are the beneficiaries of Aum regime. But it's not true. The state does not say it. Like uh, right wing forces always say that um, Hindus have uh, Hindu Hindus have occupied our government jobs, and uh, they are getting all the uh, uh, benefits of uh, they have gotten gotten all the benefits of Hasina regime. But it's not true. Hindus are oppressed as well as uh, the general Bangladeshi working class, general Bangladeshi peasantry. Hindus are as Hindus are as oppressed as that. Uh, the thing is. Uh, India has been greatly benefited by uh, our regime and the Modi government and the previous Congress has also supported the Hasina regime. So there is anti-Indian sentiment in Bangladesh, but this anti-Indian sentiment is uh, is not being seen as uh, anti-imperialism. Uh, th this is just anti-Indian. Like uh, people, the right-wing forces are not talking about American imperialism. Uh, sometimes they talk about cultural imperialism that uh, uh, America about the, or the West are doing. Like uh, uh, our culture is going rapid shifts. And they they will talk about the clothes of women. They will talk about LGBTQ, and they will they will oppose it as a, as an imposition of uh, Western culture. However, they will they are not talking about American uh, American or Western Western economic exploitation that uh, that are being handed towards uh, workers that are being handed towards our peasantries. So right now, uh, I think um, uh, all the leftists in Bangladesh uh, should work um, should work toward uh, establishing an, a kind of hegemony that will that will take their attention that will take people's attention to the imperialism, the new liberalism that is being enacted in Bangladesh. And Dr. Yunus, Dr. Muhammad Yunus uh, uh, has always been a champion, a champion of a champion of global near new liberalism. And we should talk about him as well. Uh, like the Yunus regime that is uh, that has been established here and uh, the interim government that has been established here will not uh, will not alleviate people's poverty, will not alleviate uh, Will not elevate the sufferings that uh, people are uh, that are that are being enacted towards the people by new liberalism, new colonialism. Uh, so uh, I think the left uh, uh, should focus their attention towards this instead of uh, instead instead of engaging with a cultural war with the right wing forces right now. Uh, that's from me. Thank you. Um... Thank you so much. Um, that's very important. And also because, you know, we've said about how this government can't, isn't going to improve the conditions of workers. And we've seen actually over the last week, workers in a lot of factories um, coming out protesting, striking because they haven't been paid their wages for a couple of months. Um, and I think part of the reason we're seeing, I mean, this happens anyway, there's a long history struggle of workers coming out on strike. But also, the workers, I think, are emboldened by the recent events, um, and they can also feel and have been a part of this revolutionary mo moment and movement. Um, and so this is very significant, and we have to yeah, pay attention to those struggles and see what the student leaders will do to engage with that, if, if anything. But I think what's been very useful here is the comrades pointing out, yeah, the different forces, the different layers, even within the leadership of the student movement itself, um, and keeping an eye out for that. 
and how we can then orientate ourselves as as revolutionaries mm-hmm. trying to to build a revolutionary party. And I'm really pleased to introduce Adam Powell. Adam Powell is a leading comrade of um, the Revolutionary Communist Party in Pakistan. Um, I know that the movement in Bangladesh has had a massive impact in Pakistan. Um, and I think from the point of view of the ruling class and the state in Pakistan, they're very, very fearful, actually, and very, very worried about the events and what it could potentially inspire um, in their own country as well. So, yeah, let's see what he has to say. Thank you, Fiona, and all the comrades who are here. First of all, many congratulations to the students and workers of Bangladesh for a successful revolutionary movement, which overthrew Hussina. A uh, ruling class in Pakistan is trembling because uh, workers in Pakistan, students in Pakistan are so much inspired by this movement. And uh, there's a huge discussion going on in every campus, in every workplace, in every town and city in Pakistan. And people are discussing the movement in Bangladesh, uh, how they overthrew Hussina by such a mass participation of workers, by the general strike, by uh, the non uh, cooperation movement and everything. And the Revolutionary Communist Party in Pakistan extends uh, uh, greetings for the students and workers. And secondly, we always condemn the ruling class of Bangladesh, which has very cordial relations with the ruling class of Pakistan. Many Pakistani industrialists uh, have uh, investments in Bangladesh and they are exploiting the workers in Bangladesh and in Pakistan too. Uh, many big inter- names in Karachi and Lahore have their Uh, investments in Bangladesh and uh, the ruling class of Pakistan and Bangladesh tries to protect them always. Similarly, the role of Indian imperialism should be condemned and uh, uh, how still the Modi regime is protecting Sheikh Hasina, which uh, must be uh, uh, returned to Bangladesh, uh, uh, must be arrested in India and must be shifted back to Bangladesh so she could be uh, face the justice system and face the punishment there. And uh, the working class in India, the students in India have uh, raised uh, a lot of solidarity for the uh, students and workers in Bangladesh. And I think the recent movement in Bangladesh when a young doctor in Kolkata was raped and killed and there was a huge fury and movement uh, against that, that was also inspired by the events in Bangladesh. And uh, usually it's the other way around, but this time the students in Bangladesh has inspired the students and doctors in Kolkata and in many other cities across India. So uh, once again, many congratulations. Secondly, the analysis of the movement, the discussions of the movement, I agree with all of that. And just like uh, Bashu and uh, Bubun has pointed out the issues faced by the movement now, the hesitation and confusion of the student leaders, uh, because we saw the news that they are announcing a party and then we saw the news that they are not announcing a party. There's a lot of hesitation and confusion there. And uh, then there is uh, 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 what to do with the police because they have killed hundreds of uh, students. Uh, the official count is much less. Uh, uh, the real amount of uh, the number of people killed has been uh, some uh, from some accounts more than 1,000. And these are the same police uh, which has tortured students and workers in police stations and have killed them uh, unabated. And now... Uh, we see, and then there is a uh, correctly pointed out the attacks of the right wing, the Jamaat Islami, uh, the BNP, and other right wing elements, which should be countered, which should be. Uh, I think uh, all these attacks by the right wing uh, must be fought against. And then there is a, uh, another uh, segment of the society which are called the leftists, which are always tail behind the events, which are always. Uh, apologetic about their positions, which are always trailing behind one or other factions of the ruling class and which were in complete support of the Hasina. They must also be condemned. And uh, their ideologies of Stalinism and other uh, uh, compromise, even reformist ideologies, they have they are not even Stalinist now. They have become liberals. And same is with the communist parties in India, which have played a very negative role in all this movement and have been uh, supporting Hasina uh, in all that, though that Hasina was uh, in very uh, good company with Modi and had very close relations with the Indian imperialism. So it is the duty of a revolutionary communists now to step forward. I think there should be no hesitation in the comrades now, in the, revolu- uh, in the comrades of the Revolutionary Communist International, that we should uh, step forward because the workers in Bangladesh, the peasants in Bangladesh are yearning for a change to complete the revolution. They want a 
uh, raise in their wages. Nobody is raising the slogan that the wages should be raised 100%, that the all previous wages, unpaid wages should be paid immediately. Uh, the wages uh, should be increased 100%. There should be free education. There should be free health care. There should be bread, clothing, and uh, housing for every worker. And uh, even to go forward, that the workers' committees should take over the factories. So no one is raising these slogans. So we need a party at this moment. We should, uh, we should put forward a program. All these discussions which are having today, that uh, the role of the, uh, which should be clear about the role of Dr. Yunus, which should be clear about the role of the liberal capitalist system. It should be clear about the role of the American imperialism, which has not been condemned. And uh, the Modi regime and the uh, Indian state is using this. Uh, and Indian media is highlighting it as an American conspiracy, which should be condemned. It is not an American conspiracy. The Americans and Western governments were supporting Hasina, though they had differences with the Hasina Americans, but they, in, during this movement, they never supported the movement. They were always on the side of the Hasina. They were always on the side of the big business multinational corporations who are exploiting the workers of Bangladesh. We should not have any hope, any expectations from the Chinese ruling class. China is a capitalist country. China has an imperialist ambitions in the region. Uh, we should not have hope in any ruling class of the country, either from India, from Pakistan, from any Western country. We should not ha have any hope or expectation from United Nations or European unions. They are backed by the imperialist powers, imperialist countries. So who uh, we are looking for? We are looking for solidarity, for an inter international solidarity, the solidarity from the working class in India, from Pakistan, from all over the world. But from where to begin, from where to start? This is the um, uh, important question now facing the workers in Bangladesh. And the students have led this movement. Students of Dhaka University, of Chittagong University, of many other universities were in the forefront who initiated this movement. And uh, we appreciate that they were not uh, limited to the student struggle. They were expanding their slogans. They were expanding their demands at every important juncture. They went over for a, a demand of a res resignation of Asina. They openly claimed that they will not uh, bargain on the blood of their martyrs who were being uh, killed by the police and uh, security forces. So it is the duty now to move forward. So what is the next step? This is not the end of the movement. This is not the end of the revolution. It is just the beginning. Now we have to move forward. And what is the way forward? The first step is to announce a party on a clear principle, clear basis to overthrow capitalism, to overthrow all the uh, this uh, 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 domination of uh, uh, capitalism, of multinational corporations which are exploiting workers in Bangladesh, which are uh, the uh, local bourgeoisie, local industrialists, the uh, role of Indian imperialism, the, all other imperialist powers in the region should be fought. So this is the clear ideas on which a new party uh, must be built, which must be initiated. And we can start it with, in Dhaka University from where we have students here, or we, uh, we have today students from other universities in the country. So maybe uh, like uh, it can start from 50, 100 students, but who have a clear idea, clear program, what to do next. And that is badly needed here. Uh, we can uh, uh, go on to details to analyze the situation, to uh, analyze the uh, problem facing the revolutionary movement now. But what is the solution? Uh, do Can we expect from the uh, students of Chhatra Shakti who have led this movement? I don't think so. They are dominated by, uh, there are many uh, different ideas. There are ideas of postmodernism. We should be fought. We should be uh, tackled uh, boldly and should be uh, discouraged and overthrown from the movement. There are ideas of Stalinism. There are uh, other attacks of uh, reformism, of liberalism, which needs to be counted. And that needs a solid political platform from which we can uh, defend the ideas of genuine revolutionary communism and can fought uh, not only against right-wing uh, forces like jamaat islami BNP, and others. And we need to defend. It is difficult. Uh, I understand the betrayals of the communist parties in the past, uh, betrayals of uh, other leftists, Maoists, JSD, and many other organizations in the past. And there have been opportunities. Even uh, JSD once had an opportunity to take power, but there was a hesitation. We uh, should learn from the lessons of the past revolution of 1971, uh, what happened in 1975 and other. JSD, uh, Jatiyo Samaj Tantrik, they had the opportunities to take over the power, but they hesitated. And what happened next? 
just after they hesitated that the revolution could not be completed. And they were similarly, they hesitated in 1971. Vashani hesitated in 1971, and all the leadership uh, went into the pocket of uh, Mujib. So there is lessons to learn from all those events in the past, and we should discuss those uh, lessons in our meetings, in our discussions in Bangladesh, and uh, uh, look forward that what can be done, what is to be done, which is Lenin correctly said, and he said that uh, we should build a party, we should found a party, we should found a paper, we should have a clear program and clear title. And this is not for the workers of Bangladesh or students of Bangladesh. People in Pakistan are uh, looking towards you. When we, as a revolutionary communist party, has learned a lot from the sacrifices you made, especially the courage, the uh, uh, boldness with which the students like Abu Sayyid were facing the bullets of the police. In Pakistan, we uh, have a similar environment of intimidation, of threats, of state repression, of uh, police torture and uh, killings uh, by the army operations in all of Pakistan in different areas across the country. And there are movements uh, erupting in one part of the country, another part of the country. And uh, we are trying to uh, uh, bring those movements together. Similarly, there is a movement in India. In the past, we saw the farmers' movement. We saw the general strike of the Indian working class. Uh, now we see a movement uh, starting from Kolkata and West Bengal and is spreading to all over India. And there is a strike of doctors all over India. Similarly, we saw a movement in Sri Lanka, uh, which overthrew the president. But after a few months, we see the uh, president of Sri Lanka, which was ousted, Rajapaksha, has flown back. All the uh, student activists and leaders who were leading the movement are uh, sitting in jails or uh, being punished for that, and all old regime is there in back uh, into power. So we need to uh, learn f lessons from all those movements. We need to uh, show a way forward for the movement, and uh, we should, uh, if uh, these kinds of things are not uh, uh, dealt in a, uh, a concrete way, we can see that the Hasina is trying to come back. Modi will always try to bring Hasina back. The current regime, like the Home Minister in Bangladesh, has uh, given very favorable remarks for Hasina. The Army Chief, you know, everybody know, has uh, very close relations with Hasina. And there is a whole regime in the regime. Uh, there are factions in the regime who want Hasina back. And uh, even the right-wing elements would uh, embrace her as a, uh, a symbol of stability and bringing back the old status quo. But what is the workers in Bangladesh are thinking? What is the peasants in Bangladesh are thinking? What is the ordinary students in Bangladesh are thinking? They want uh, to see the gains of revolution. They want an increase in wages. They want free education. They want full employment for everyone. And these are the steps which uh, this interim regime is has not taken. They have not announced an increase in wages. They have not announced a reduction in the prices of electricity prices of uh, fuel, prices of other daily essentials. They should have been reduced. There should be taxes uh, at least uh, announced on the multinationals and other industrialists. There should be uh, a demand, uh, a whole transitional demand from the students uh, for the interim government that these measures should be immediately taken so that people can uh, relieve, get relief from uh, inflation, from unemployment and others. And similarly, if these uh, steps are not taken, we should organize uh, committees of workers and students to take over the universities, to take over the factories, to take over the whole country, to uh, fully implement those demands and uh, to end this capitalist system once and for all. So these are the steps we need to take. But the first step is to build a party, to consolidate all those uh, comrades, all those uh, students and workers who think uh, in these terms and who are clear that this interim government uh, does not represent the interests of the workers, rather they represent the interests, uh, Mama Yunus especially interest of the American imperialism. And uh, there is a class war, there is a class conflict in Bangladesh between those who are exploiting the workers in garments industry and other sectors, and there is a uh, interest of the working class is completely opposed to them. And we need to link uh, with the workers in uh, telecommunication sectors and railways and others. And we know that uh, there and we should be clear about the role of the trade union leaders, which have been very friendly with the old regime, which have been very uh, cozy with the industrialists, and which have gained at the expense of the working class. So we that is why we are asking uh, for the new committees to emerge, and there are already protests there. So they, but there is no political party, no political force 
which can consolidate all of these struggles going on in different factories, different campuses, different struggle. I was uh, seeing that the students in East Delta University, in Chittagong University, in Komila University, in Silhad University are uh, discussing different steps uh, in their university and how they can move forward. But there is no organized platform, there is no organized political party and the leadership of Chhatra Shakti, leadership of this uh, student movement is hesitant, is under the influence of postmodernist ideas, under the influence of liberal ideas and anarchist ideas and other ideas. But uh, we need a clear program on the basis of revolutionary communism. And this revolutionary communist international, I think, has uh, clearly supported the students. And uh, we can proudly say is that we are on the only uh, organization on the left uh, which was clearly supporting this movement from the very beginning. And we held an international solidarity campaign for the students who were arrested in all over the countries across the world. And uh, uh, we should not be apologetic about that being leftist. We should not be apologetic about uh, being a revolutionary communist. And we should distance ourselves from all those betrayals of the left, all those crimes of Stalinism, all those uh, crimes of uh, the communist parties in the past, whether they were Stalinists or Maoists or other factions. We should be clear that we uh, stand for the legacy of Lenin and Trotsky, for the legacy of the Communist International, for the legacy of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, and the legacy of the Russian Revolution of 1970, uh, which overthrew the regime of Tsar in uh, Russia through a revolution. And in Bangladesh, we are looking forward to a similar revolution. And Bangladesh is a very special case. In Pakistan, uh, the ruling class was celebrating uh, the Independence Day in India also uh, yesterday. Uh, but uh, Bangladesh has suffered from the uh, partition on the basis of religion in 1947, on the basis of uh, nationality in, in 1971. But still, we see that the people from the same religion, people from the same uh, language spoken and nationality are killing people uh, uh, of the same religion and nationality, which is a class war, which is clear in Bangladesh now, that it is not a uh, issue of religion. It is not a uh, issue of nation or language. It is an issue of a class war. And unless uh, we overthrow capitalism, unless the working class emerges as a victorious class, and it is not the, just a socialist revolution in Bangladesh, it will be the beginning of a socialist revolution of whole of subcontinent of South Asia, which will spread to, uh, to the Indian subcontinent. There will be a socialist revolution in India. There will be uh, the socialist revolution in Pakistan with overthrow of these brutal regimes, these anti-worker, anti-people, anti-human regimes in India and Pakistan and Sri Lanka and others. And we will undo these crimes of partition, whether it was in 1947 or else, and we will bring together all the people under the umbrella of a socialist, uh, voluntary socialist federation of South Asia, which will be the beginning of a world socialist revolution, a, a world which will be clean of all those uh, filth of the imperialist classes, of the ruling classes, and there will be, uh, just like uh, Lenin said, one family living under one sky, and which will, uh, for which the Marx raised the slogans of workers of the world unite. So we uh, support the students and workers in Bangladesh, and we wish them uh, uh, best in their coming months and, uh, uh, for their struggle, and we hope that they will found a revolutionary communist party there and will move forward overthrow capitalism. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, as Adam has just explained, we are in a class war um, and we are fighting it at different places, at different fronts, but from London to Dhaka to Lahore, we are all part of the same struggle and the same fight. And we are trying to build such a party um, that can help be the midwife to these revolutions taking place all over the world. Um, and so if you're in Bangladesh, if you're anywhere in the world, please do sign up to our form um, and, and, and join the Revolutionary Communist International. We live through a time of revolutions and, and counter revolutions. Um, and so it's vital that everywhere we can train people up, train up Marxist cases who learn, study the past, study previous revolutions, study the class struggle itself um, to make sure that we are in the best possible position to make the most of these huge events that are going to take place in all of our lifetimes all over the world. So thank you so much to every single person who's spoken um, in the meeting. Just before we end, I'm just going to bring back um, Ben Curry, who's just going to sum up the discussion um, and help set our sights for where we go from here. So thank you.
Ben. <laughs> um, thanks, Fiona. And uh, th yeah, thank you to all of the comrades who have uh, come in. It's been a really, uh, a really enriching discussion, I think. And um, the first thing I want to do is uh, just add a little bit. Adam was talking about the international significance of the um, events in Bangladesh. And I want to underline this, this point, the, the significance that it's, it's not just uh, the masses in, in India, um, in, uh, in Pakistan, in West Bengal, as we've seen, you know, this mass movement that's erupted over the, the, the horrific rape and murder of this young doctor. But I think people all over the world are uh, looking at, at, at these events and are tremendously inspired by these events. Um, to the extent that they get through the press censorship, you know, the, the when the lockdown was taking place, uh, the curfew and the, sh the telecoms lockdown, um, the, there was a conspiracy of silence by the world media because uh, they felt like uh, they could they could feel the ground uh, uh, rumbling beneath their feet with what was going on in Bangladesh and the ruling class everywhere. They feel like they're living they're, they're sitting on top of a volcano and it's exploding in in Bangladesh, but it could just as easily explode here. I mean, it's no coincidence, I think, that we've seen a revolution in Sri Lanka just two years ago. We've seen a revolutionary uh, upheaval that led to the storming of the parliament in Kenya, masses on the streets in uh, in Nigeria. Um, we're, we're seeing the situation in, uh, in in France, the unprecedented political polarization at the, at the elections. They're all symptoms of the same fundamental thing, which is that, uh, that capitalism has reached a complete and utter dead end. And... Um, it's, it's not a coincidence, I think, that many, many countries like Bangladesh, like Sri Lanka, like Kenya, until a few years ago, they were, they were hailed as economic miracles, right? They were, they were shown up as the, the, you know, the, the great examples of, uh, of, of capitalist success stories. Well, they're not capitalist success stories anymore. They're all heading in the same direction, you know, particularly since 2020. Um, when, when the, the, you know, the, the rich capitalist countries could, could through massive stimulus spending, they could, they could bail out their own, their own companies and so forth and, and protect the economy and the, and even to, to a degree, protect the masses from the worst impact of the crisis in 2020. That wasn't possible in Sri Lanka or in Bangladesh or in, or in Kenya. And, uh, that, 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 what we've seen is that's fed through into, you know, all of these countries are approaching uh, bankruptcy. You have a, a collapse of foreign currency reserves. You have prices spiraling through the roof. Not just in one or two countries, but all over the world, and this, that's the that's what they're afraid of. The same conditions that have developed in Bangladesh and have spawned this revolution have the potential to to, to explode into revolutionary events in, in in numerous countries all over the world. I read that there's um, um, 140 countries which are, uh, are spending ab above 40 percent of their national income on uh, debt repayment. This is the biggest debt crisis in human history, worse than the the the, 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 the debt crisis in the 80s and the 90s. Um, it's the deepest debt crisis in human history, and whole whole parts of the world are are, are like dominoes on the brink of of falling, um, and triggering an enormous debt crisis. And uh, it's, it reminds me a little bit of of what we saw in uh, just immediately after the two thousand eight crisis in the Middle East. Right, you saw uh, similar conditions produce similar results, and the, ins the the inspiring example of one example it began in Tunisia, but of course the center everyone was looking at the events in Cairo. The, uh, the events in Egypt. Um, there again, this, the crisis of capitalism led to the rise of, uh, of, of prices, particularly bread and these sort of things. And uh, this, when revolution broke out, it spread all across the uh, it spread all across the region. And people are taking people are taking inspiration in in the subcontinent for what's going on in Bangladesh and all around the world. The, 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 the people in, in Nigeria were directly inspired by the people on the streets in in Kenya. Um, it's like, in many respects, the world is, is similar to the situation that we saw in, in, in 1968, when the whole world was, was uh, convulsed by revolution. And at that time, Pakistan and uh, uh, Bangladesh also had a revolution that culminated, of course, in independence. Um, the difference now is actually the crisis is deeper. That happened in the midst of a boom of the capitalist system. Now the crisis is even deeper. And uh, that's why precisely in, in, in 2018 that you, you had a, a movement of the students, but it didn't lead to a revolution. But now the anger is building up so much. It's built up and built up so much that there is an unbearable pressure in the daily lives of millions of people. And it was, it was the, the, the students with a spark which have ignited an enormous revolutionary movement. Now, in, if we, we can draw parallels with the events in, in the 1970s and the, the events today. There was the possibility at that time that the left could have led the revolution in, in Bangladesh um, instead of the um, uh, Mujib and the, the Awami League basically taking the leadership of the, 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 the independent struggle. 
The left, in particular the Maoists, were very strong in the 1960s, but they failed to take a lead because, because of the betrayals of the Stalinist leaderships, the, the Maoist leaderships, who said that you shouldn't, you shouldn't carry out a revolution because actually Maoist China was, was uh, very much aligned with, Pakistan, with West Pakistan at that time. Um, and give full support to the, the the government in West Pakistan and the ruling class. They were very close, um, and therefore these betrayals led inevitably to others filling the vacuum. If if there isn't a good leadership for this revolution, a bad leadership will fill the vacuum, and that's the point, right? Um, and in in the end, the the Awami League, of course, they 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 uh, they uh, were the ones that came to power, and they strove to create a new domestic capitalist class of exploiters and a, and a corrupt, rotten clique that came to dominate the country for 50 years after independence. Now, in the revolution which is taking place now, I think we have to say similarly, in the absence of a good rev uh, revolutionary leadership, bad leadership can come to the fore. And yes, you have extremely reactionary right-wing parties that are no better whatsoever than, uh, the, the, than the Awami League, the groups like the BNP and Jamaat and uh, others. Uh, people are, are worried about the what is there a chance that these parties will come to power? Uh, what is the uh, what is the um, uh, perspective as far as that is concerned? Well, if these uh, groups are able to to play a role, and there is an absence of left wing leadership, and in fact, as comrades have described, the left is quite often despite the word left wing is like an insult. That if if that is the case in many campuses and in many parts of the country. That is because of the, 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 the awful, treacherous role that the left-wing parties have played. And in particular, we see this all over the, the world. Our, our comrades in the US are very familiar with this idea of lesser evilism. Always the left of the Communist Party in the USA, they support the Democrats, this big business billionaire-backed party every election, uh, because, they don't, because otherwise the greater evil Trump will get in. In the end, it doesn't stop the greater evil getting in. Trump will get, uh, got in last time and, and he may well be on to get in again because of the, the experience. People are sick and tired of Biden. But you see a similar lesser evilism amongst the so-called left in Bangladesh, where they've su supported uh, the, the, many of the left uh, parties like the JSD and the Workers' Party and so forth, have supported the Awami League as the lesser evil because at least they're secular. And if they, if they, if, 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 if they uh, um, are, are kicked out of power, then you'll get uh, Jamaat Islami or, or some other group and you'll have communal violence and so forth. And that has completely served to discredit the left. Actually, it hasn't stopped a revolution from breaking out. It's just meant that they're completely impotent to play a role in events as they unfold. Now, that doesn't mean that there is massive support for the BNP and Jamaat Islami. I saw a, um, a, a Facebook um, poll uh, on, a, on a group of uh, revolution, uh, revolutionary students group on Facebook uh, in which 35,000 people voted and they asked, which party do you want to, to enter back into power now that the Awami League has been picked out? And 85% said we need a new party or some new leadership or new organization. I think 1% said Jamaat Islami and maybe 4% said the BNP. In other words, there is an enormous vacuum there. And this there isn't mass support for the BNP and, and for uh, th these other parties, these right other right-wing parties. What there is, is there is an anger and a hatred at all parties, which is reflected in what the comrades were just saying, that there is a bit of an anti-political mood, which has a healthy side in a sense that, uh, yeah, all of these parties are, are, are hated to a degree. And, and it's, it's, it's understandable because they've, played, they've all played such a treacherous role. But it's, uh, it's an incorrect uh, uh, method. What is needed is, uh, is if you've got bad leadership, if you've got these rotten corrupt parties that represent the ruling class, you need a revolutionary party based upon the, uh, uh, the, the fight for socialist revolution. Um, now, what, what role can the, the likes of BNP and Jamaat al-Islami play? Well, the, the, the advantage that they, their advantage is that they're organized, that they're organized and they're well-funded, right? And the, the revolutionary uh, uh, youth, on the streets and the workers, they don't have a political organization. So they will be able to organize and, and try to consolidate some influence within the student movement and within committees. And to the extent that their influence grows, actually they will demoralize uh, the, the mass of students and workers who will, who will leave these organizations and they will lead them to shrivel and uh, uh, they, 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 it will lead to a, a, a retreat of the, of the movement to some extent. But the, the millions that came out onto the street were not supporters of the BNP or Jamaat Islami. They were they were ordinary workers, ordinary students, uh, you know, um, um, uh, in the in the in the um, informal sector, peasants, middle class layers. They were just sick of the entire system. The point is, though, that uh, there's now a struggle of living forces, and unless uh, yes, unless we organise a revolutionary party. Um, which which rejects all of this lesser evilism and says the working class has to seize power into its own hands, which we have to sweep away the whole regime, not choose of a lesser evil of which is the which is the lesser evil faction within the capitalist class. 
um, and uh, can appeal to the, 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 the most revolutionary students and of the vanguard of the working class in particular, then uh, it is possible for other groups and factions. We saw that with the Arab Spring. I just mentioned the Arab Spring, right? We had a, a, a tremendous, you, you could not have asked for more in terms of courage, bravery, and self-sacrifice on the part of the Egyptian working class. Precisely because there wasn't a clear revolutionary leadership, all of the exertions and all of the efforts of the Egyptian workers did not lead to a fundamental change in the regime. Mubarak was brought down, but after many uh, 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 struggles, eventually the army reconsolidated its position. That is the danger unless there is a decisive break with the capitalist system, which can only happen on the basis of building a Bolshevik party, a revolutionary communist party. And we have to start from the, the reality, which is that party doesn't exist. We have, to be, we have to begin that process. We can't start from where we would like to be. It would be very nice if there was such a party already. We have to start uh, down that road from the place we're in now, which is that we have the correct ideas, but now we need to start collecting together the best of the students and so forth and the best advanced workers into the nucleus with, around which we will form this future party. Um, and until that is done, there is, uh, yeah, that, that, that is the fundamental task that, uh, that remains uh, to be done. But the perspective is a very positive one. Now, th th this movement went beyond, very quickly went beyond the students. I think that it's quite clear from the reports that comrades gave, there's, there's a heterogene heterogeneity amongst the students. There's different views. And as this revolution progresses, there's going to be divisions and, and differentiation between the, the, the genuinely revolutionary elements and those that, that fall behind some of the right-wing parties or what have you. There's going to be that differentiation. Things are in flux. And in a revolution, consciousness changes extremely rapidly. Even workers and middle-class layers that maybe had some illusions in the old opposition parties, even until the recent period, will lose those illusions on the basis of experience and will be open to our ideas if we can reach them and if we can grow a force which is capable of reaching them. We will be able, that, that, that fundamentally I think is the, uh, the perspective is, is, is actually quite a, uh, uh, an optimistic one. That, but the only, fundamentally the only class in society, the only group in society, which has a consistent revolutionary interest in overthrowing the whole system is the working class and the best students need to turn, form a party and turn to the workers who are now beginning to enter struggle and who are going to learn and draw more radical conclusions. The consciousness, consciousness can be very static in normal times, right? In, in times of, uh, of, of, uh, of when the system seems stable, the regime seems stable, people just get on with things. They maybe vote for this party or for that party. But, um, but uh, in revolutionary times, consciousness can change with extreme rapidity. Um, already people have been completely transformed. You talk about, comrades have just said, there's millions of people that now have opened, have started to think about politics for the first time. And that's, that's what's really significant about the present situation. Millions of people who normally see politics as something being done by other people, by the politicians, by the journalists, by the corrupt uh, uh, officials and so forth. Now they see that they have a tremendous power in their fingertips and they're going to begin entering the scene and trying to, 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 to change society in their own interest. And they will learn on that process. We need to grow in the midst of that process and we need to connect with that growing movement of the, uh, of, of the revolutionary masses, which hasn't ended, but we, which is really just going to be beginning now. This is, the, this is the opening stages of a process which is going to develop and it's a struggle of living forces. How that will play out is not settled in advance and we have a role to play, which is why comrades should join the Revolutionary Communist International and begin the process of building that Bolshevik type of organization precisely to fight for an October type, an October revolution in Bangladesh, a, a completion of the revolution, which can only be a socialist revolution at the end of the day. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, and thank you once again to all of the speakers um, who joined our meeting today. As we've said many, many times, um, this is not the end of the process or the movement or the revolution. Um, and so be sure to stay in touch with us, um, stay in touch with the Revolution Communist International wherever you are, especially if you're in Bangladesh. And let's see what let's see what we can do. Um, but whatever happens, we know there's more struggles to take place. So thank you so much for coming. Um, and we'll see you all again soon, potentially at a future meeting of this kind, depending on what takes place um, in Bangladesh. So thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>